Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming uh, to tonight, the fifth installment of Other Uses, um, the year-long screening program that we have here at MPAC. Um, so I'm delighted to um, introduce the work of Ulysses Jenkins. Um, tonight is structured as a sort of small retrospective of work from across his career. Um, we'll be beginning with a work that from the middle of Ulysses' career that I think does um, a good job of kind of structuring some of the kind of foundational questions of his practice and his kind of his, his formal style. Um, tonight, uh, tonight's program is presented in coordination and collaboration with Electronic Arts Intermix in New York and with the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia. Um, and so I wanted to take the opportunity to thank um, the folks at those institutions for making tonight happen. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Lucas Matheson. I'm a graduate student at Williams College, and I've been working this past year with Victoria Brooks, um, curator of time-based media here at MPAC, and working to develop this program um, with, with Ulysses, and as such, we're delighted to have him here um, for a conversation after the screening. So um, that's about all I have to say. Ulysses and I will be having a conversation on stage afterwards. Um, and again, thank you all for coming. Help me to understand what went wrong, and I don't mean this morning. I didn't do this to take your career away. I did it because you need help, and if your so-called friends weren't big enough to tell you, at least I was, you hurt me, and I was big enough to stand up to you and tell you you need help. You hurt me, and I'm trying to help you. You don't give a damn no more how low down you are. of images you've gotten to know from years and years of TV shows. The hurt and pain, the hurt and pain. Was written and bitten into your veins. The forces of fire, water, and air, billions Imagine these billions of years as
So, Ulysses, I thought we would start by talking about um, a kind of formal quality that I see shared across the videos that we've seen today, um, namely rhythm. And I think rhythm pops up in your films in a couple of different ways, namely through the recurrence of music, um, the kind of, particularly in Planet X, the kind of rhythms of crashing waves, the rhythms of nature, kind of repetition formally, repetition of history, um, and particularly inconsequential doggerel, right, this idea of the doggerel as being a poem with a uh, sort of irregular rhythm. Um, and so I was wondering if we could start by talking about that idea of, of rhythm and how it, and sort of its role within your work. Uh, well, rhythm in, in, in that sense um, is something that I feel that uh, we all have, first of all. But I, when I started editing video, I mean, you might even recognize something of that by, while watching the Watts video. Um, with, in particular, with war and, and, and their concept. I mean, actually, that was the first time I ever uh, documented and recorded uh, a musical group, okay? And um, to that extent, maybe even if we begin with the beginning of the sh program you have tonight, um, with secrecy. Because help me to understand uh, becomes the pivot point within that video that every time it comes to help me to understand, it's asking you, the viewer, a question. And to, a, to the extent that that question doesn't get answered, OK? So if you want to talk about the, the rhythm uh, that's in these other videos, um, I'm going to have to go to inconsequential doggerel, because doggerel is the way in which I started to contextualize the work that I make. And if you know the definition of doggerel, an irregular variation on a theme, sometimes a comedic verse, there you have it. I don't know, does that answer your it question? It does, <laughs> it does, it does. Um, so going with that, that question of, or that kind of theme of irregularity, um, of the kind of repetition that breaks up the kind of smooth flow of these, of these pieces, you know, it's in that repetition that kind of brings us back to where we just were. Um, it makes me think about another theme in your work, namely that of history. Yeah. Um, and again, to think about Planet X in particular, your unity of or you, your unification of Sumerian lore and a sort of Afrofuturist kind of consideration, particularly through mm -hmm. um, the words of, 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 of Sun Ra taken from that interview. Um, so I was wondering also if you could talk about it. I know that we spoke as well about part of the appeal to you initially of video was that it was a medium that did not have as much of a history or any history at all. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about, um, about history. Well, just in, 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 in contextualizing again what you just said, um, when I started video, uh, thus so many years ago, around 1972, that you see the first video I ever made, which was the Watts Festival. Um, this whole notion of whether or not there's a history, there, there was no history almost for me to follow as an African-American video artist, which I became recognized as. Uh, there may have been two other persons who, uh, from the African American uh, extract, that made videos: Tony Ramos, Ed Burrell. Um, but I hadn't seen a lot of their work, and I didn't know much about their work. So, to a certain degree, for those who've had the opportunity to have seen my Vimeo pages, um, I had to try to construct a notion of what I thought video could be for a person who was not necessarily considered the future. That's where Sun Ra comes in. Uh, as far as what he's telling you about 
these premises of what is occurring within that video. Um, the, the whole notion of Afrofuturism as it is now being spoken of, of course, um, sometimes people who talk about Afrofuturism don't even mention uh, those of us who started doing video back in the 70s. Uh, it's like it only starts with hip hop. And so in that extent, it's sort of whether or not you're getting left out or not realized that once you start to change this medium, I mean, the early video uh, that I was involved in, and I think people who started at that time, we were trying to, uh, first and foremost, we were complaining about television. The whole idea that television was putting that much of uh, influence on society. So from that standpoint, and, and I said this to you earlier, that's why, that's why the videos were always so long. <laughs> we figured if you made them long, they'd bore the audience. But uh, time caught up with that notion. But uh, for the most part, uh, this relationship to the future that you're indicating in Planet X, you see, Planet X contextualizes something that's from the past, and then again, it goes into the future. And I had mentioned to you this whole idea of, uh, which comes from the uh, book called Mumbo Jumbo, uh, this whole notion of go going forward and backwards at the same time. Ishmael Reed put that in his, in his uh, literary uh, book. And so that in itself is, rich, is, is referenced by Alondra Nelson in her journal of called Futurism, excuse me, that's in uh, uh, Duke Press. But at the same, at, and in that context, that's in a way why you have this, what is it now, a trillion dollars for Black Panther? Close to it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, in that sense, th this is what I, I was also mentioning to you. See, I had my students do a contextualization of the current Black Panther, which is a Marvel comic, from the HBO documentary of the Black Panthers. Can anybody see the, a similarity? No, no, I have no, nobody says anything. OK, so in that, in that sense, that's the forward and going backwards kind of context that I'm mentioning. Because to a, to a larger extent, that is what I feel we as a culture are experiencing every day. But we don't acknowledge the fact that we are living the past and the, trying to go to a future that we can't define because some people are stuck in the past. I won't go into who that is. But for the most part, I hope I answered your question again. Yes. Okay. Yes, you did. All right. Um, so I think, again, going off of some of the things that you said there about this kind of these early um, black video artists working within, uh, working with a kind of dissatisfaction with television. Um, I was wondering if you could speak about your personal relationship with um, television, what, it, what that looks like now, what it looked like then, what it looked like even before that in, in, in your childhood. Well, of course, I'm, I'm, an, I'm, an, I, I'm a, chil, a, tel, a child of television past, a uh, history. Um, when I was a child, television was being relinquished onto society. You know, television starts actually just before World War II breaks out, but they hold off until we win the war. And uh, I'm born a year after World War II has concluded, and television is out there. And I used to go and watch television at the neighbor's house. And one day, the neighbors on a Sunday, when I was hoping to see Hopalong Cassidy, they weren't home. And I had this major tantrum. And my mom said, oh my god, I got to get my baby a television. So 
in that context, that, and to answer your question, that's when I started to scrutinize television. Because for those people who, who do happen to know about back in the day, when you saw an African American on television, it was like, ho, oh, call everybody. Go tell them somebody black is on the TV. OK? So in that sense, I watched the progression. Uh, even it's interesting when War was singing that song, uh, and they started mentioning the black guy on Mod Squad. Well, you know who that is, right? That's Clarence Williams III. You know, he plays Prince's father in Purple Rain. Okay, I mean, there's you know a lot of history that sort of flows through this through this work. But in in the other things that I, of course gathered from watching TV, by the time, first of all, when I started to go into video, I was a muralist. And I painted murals. And I, and I painted stories in the murals that I painted. And to the extent that when there were some guys from out here on the East Coast brought up, for those of you who know what they are, the Porter Pack. They brought a Porter Pack to the boardwalk of Venice, where I was actually working. And a friend of mine says, hey, man, they got this video machine. You ought to check it out. And this is at the, really also at the beginning of independent film. And I'm saying, oh, man, I, I got my wall to keep me warm. What do I need video for? But I, of course, went down to my curiosity. And I went down, and I, I said, man, this is marvelous. Because here, now you have a machine that you can record, but you can also erase what you didn't want. What does that mean? Well, I first of all, don't have to go out and start, you know, trying to get all this money you need to make a movie. And I could actually produce something to whatever degree that I want, I can produce it with this technology. So with that, let's say, accent on the term that became the term of the day, access. Anybody here worry about access? Because in those days, not only having access came along cable access. And that would give you a distribution opportunity. So from that, I, that's where my Watts Festival video kind of uh, plays into. And as a matter of fact, I find it interesting. I'm able to show that tonight. Uh, that was the first video I ever screened in New York City in a cable access festival. So it seems like that video's come a, a very long way to be in, a, in, in to be you know more exact about that. So the whole notion of cable access, to, for those who are you know younger here, cable access was like the beginning of the internet. And the fact that more people had the opportunity to voice their opinions, to change at least the perspective of what you saw every night on the news, because you could, you could proclaim your own truth. That's, to me, what video represented it, really. It's like, I'm going to say what I want to say without it being censored and without somebody else having to tell me, now, 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 that's not the way we are supposed to think, OK? Um, yeah, so going off that, as for those of you who had a chance to look at the, at the program notes, um, in part one, the, be, the very beginning of Remnants of the Watts Festival, there's a kind of epigraph. Um, and Ulysses, you write in that epigraph that the video was made at a time when the myth of public access was still being preached. And so I was, I'm wondering if I could push you a little further on that and ask what, what that means, what, what about this public access, which you just mentioned, you know, that there was something positive about it, that it did um, represent some, that there was a, a hopeful quality, a liberatory quality to it. Um, but talk to me about, about how, this, how, this, how this was a myth, um, and also you know, just what well, in when the I, sense Well, when means. I was making that commentary, excuse me for cutting you off. No. But when I was making that commentary about being a myth, to a certain degree, the mythology of having free access to actually getting on television, that was what we were trying to actually dispel, okay? And to, to the extent that 
You could. I mean, dear, not, um, if you know a little bit about this history, you know about a group named Paper Tiger. And if you saw any of, I, when I saw their videos, I was just astounded because they actually showed a, a video that you would not believe that the, the networks would not show you, which was the Republican Convention in 1972. And talking about pulling the covers off of the animal that was in there, I mean, they actually were able to take you backstage to where they did all the deals and all the, all the other things that go on at these conferences. And of course, the thing that really blew me away was when I saw Sammy Davis Jr. hugging Richard Nixon. I said, no, that's not, that's not Sammy. So you started to recognize this, this, this notion of the, of the power confluence that goes on, which nowadays we see more readily and available to actually dispel who's doing what. But back then, that just really blew me away. And it was, if it wasn't for uh, the, the ability to have this access. See, the thing, getting back to what you were talking about, the, the, the spelling of the myth, today you can make your videos with your cell phones. We had to, back then, had to figure out how we can actually get some equipment, which is where the word access becomes this magic word. And somebody would say, you mean you got access? Where are you getting access at? And the only other place that maybe some people could get opportunity to get equipment was if you were working in an educational institution or the cable TV station in your community. The fact that the government passed a bill giving community members access to not just the cable distribution system, but to the technology to actually make it. And that's, that's the part of the myth part of it that we were trying to also, I was trying to say, dispel. Because if you didn't have the technology, <laughs> you weren't in the game. That's just the name of the game. OK, so I think that now we have some time to take any questions from the audience if any of you folks have questions. Vic has a microphone over there. Vic, we have a question in the front here. So just maybe riffing off of that last piece about if you didn't have the technology, you weren't in the game, could you speak to your changing relationship to technology throughout your, your videos. Something that, that um, we talked about at the EAI screening was like how impressive the, the number of technologies that you've used throughout your career is. So maybe if you could just speak to, you, you talked about the port -a pack but maybe more in general, the, the kinds of technologies that, that you were drawn to or used. Well, the port -a pack was the beginning of the, of the whole, you know, the whole game, if you will. And you might have seen certain kind of tech, you know, port pack techniques when you're watching that, that watch tape in particular that scene with, the, uh, uh, with war. Because we didn't have editing equipment when, when I first got involved in it. And so you saw in certain places where there were cuts, that was, those cuts are being made by turning the camera on and turning the camera off. <laughs> And, you know, you become a real student of, of, of meter or measure within a composition so that you can know that, okay, if I cut this thing off, when do I turn it back on? And so you're counting a one, a two, a th okay, now I turn it on. And, that's, and that's, that was the beginning, if you will, of realizing the power of editing. So to get that power of editing, again, that's where this whole notion of having a relationship with an institution, which cable TV gave us, for the most part, for a lot of people, it was the first time you had the opportunity to edit. Uh, but in the other hand, in the West Coast, there was this place in Southern California at the Long Beach Art Museum. We, the art museum had an editing uh, um, uh, capability for the artists to actually go and start to edit their videos. Um, but you know, some people actually, I know, actually were using scissors. They were doing a film technique with scotch tape. That 
I could, I never wanted to do that. <laughs> there was, that's really dangerous in terms of the, the how do you resync up a piece of tape that doesn't have sprockets? I mean, all the stuff the film has. So you, you don't know whether or not you're really going to be able to match the video. As you could see in some of those scenes in that video I'm speaking of, I was capable of doing that. And some, I was looking at them, wow, I actually made that edit? <laughs> so, but, you know, that's, that's, that's one. But then when editing came in, that changed things. And then, of course, you actually, I'm interested you asked that, because the first video, Secrecy, that was actually my first desktop edited video. So that's why it looks kind of strange. But the notion of secrecy, and I just want to mention that from the standpoint, for those who may or may not understand some of my work, and you see it a little bit with uh, inconsequential. The activity of ritual within the work that I was making as far as my, my, my friends that were also, I, I collaborated with, Miran Hassinger, Sarah Nagudi, and, uh, and then maybe there's a, this is, if you've ever seen this, this, video, this film by Barbara McCullough called uh, Water Ritual, Actually, I, when I saw Water Ritual, that's why I'm naked here, OK? Because she puts a woman in the place of empowering that particular film in a, in a place where she urinates on the ground in a squatted position nude. And I said, wow, that's it. That's the power, as it also relates to my sense of being an African-American, OK? But um, what was the beginning of your question again? Um, oh, you mean the different changes. OK, so you can see the technological changes by the, the way in which the uh, technology advances. And generally, the clarity in your videos got, I think they got better <laughs> as, as time would move along, the resolution. OK? Uh, that's the one thing that I can say this was nice. But then, of course, now that since it went from desktop to actual software, OK, now that changes the other thing. We were having this conversation earlier about going from a Final Cut to Premiere. And of course, Final Cut, they did this whole thing about, well, you know, we want to actually get you get more software out there. So they made a, another version from the version which was being utilized by most people was Final Cut 7. So they come up with 10. And 10 is not 7, but a, 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 <laughs> a, a really crazy way of making you think that you're going to get what you could get. See, what happens with this software is your ability to control the medium. So they want to, do, so now what people are doing, they're going to Premiere, which Premiere is actually, was one of the first uh, desktop video uh, editing systems, I mean, a software in the first place. So that's where a lot of people are moving towards uh, these days. Um, but in terms of the technology, I'm, I'm just going to mention this when, because I, I actually I said this word about uh, cell phones. And uh, 1987, I worked with a group called Electronic Cafe. You can look them up and look for their piece called Hole in Space. They did this transmission from New York to LA by satellite. And this is around the same time that Nightline got started with the Iran hostages circumstance. So at that time, to have artists actually using the same technology that broadcast television was doing, it was, it was a marvel. So in, in that sense, I worked with them during the 84 Olympics in LA. And in all of the ethnic communities, they created these desktop situations in cafes. And it, it, was, it was a marvel because at that t in essence, that was like a multicultural connection within the city for the Olympics. Here's just a small example. I'm working in the, in, in, in the hood or in the African-American community. 
And when the adults walked in and saw all this technology, they ran to their tables. When the kids came in, they ran to the technology. They saw Star, Star Trek, and they wanted to be a part of that. And so this whole notion of do, how are we going to embrace this future, as it was sort of indicated here, the kids will go specifically there because they are not afraid. What the fear, would you say, what is the fear? Does, does any of you feel that technology makes you feel stupid? <laughs> technophobia, okay? The, the, the real reality of technophobia, the fact that you actually, we actually saw it uh, in, in that sense, this was in 1984, I thought, oh, wow, Orwell, what happened here? Okay? So in, in that sense, the advancement of the technology, we still got a few more things. I mean, I was interested in what they were showing me today when I was talking with Virginia, and she's, she's talking about 3D television. How many of you got a 3D television? How many of you think you need a 3D television? <laughs> and how many of you go to 3D movies? Think about it. So the need versus what you may be accustomed to. Some people say they go to 3D movies and they get, they get uh, nauseated. And, they, and they, don't, they don't get the fulfillment that they think they were going to get. Because now depth perception, as you know it, as, we, as when was I talking to you guys? I'll keep doing this once since I've been here. About depth perception and how many of you want to go to Mars? Come on, I'm going to see the hands. I don't see many. Oh, there's a few. OK, now, you know that we are beings of gravity. OK, and so because of that sensibility that we just happen to have, everybody on the space station has to worry about their internal organs moving to other places when you're in outer space. As a matter of fact, your eyeballs don't stay in the same position that you need to actually read your instructions, OK? So, <laughs> so all this stuff that has to do with being a being that's based in gravity, you see, is something you need to question. As a matter of fact, the two Kelly brothers, I don't know if you saw this in the news, one of the one that lived on the space station for a year, he has a different DNA from his brother now. I didn't know space could do that. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, in the middle. Yes, sir. Uh, so I'm. <laughs> I'm fairly young, hopefully, but uh, so I don't have a lot of historical perspective, but uh, you were talking about a lot about access earlier. So I was wondering, uh, to me it feels almost as if we have uh, too much access because people are just yelling at each other across the entire nation from the comfort of their uh, computer screens. And so it feels almost crushing that are just like that we have uh, so much access, but ac we have so much access, but it's access to just garbage. So I was just hoping to get your perspective on the the modern condition of access. Okay, so you want me to stop taking out the trash? <laughs> no, I'm just making a joke there. But consider what you just told me, and then we consider what is what is our problem these days. We have an abundance of information. First of all, unfortunately, in which, um, uh, um, yeah, I'm, there is this notion that there are some people who really don't care about education, and they think that everybody who has an education, they are the elites, and that what they have to say uh, is not measurable to what the everyday person would want to be aware of. Well, first and foremost, the, the notion of whether or not are you listening? Like you just said, 
people are shouting at and, and around and away from one another. And if you don't, see, here's the real problem with all this access. If there are so many voices that are out there, do you know which one to listen to? In some ways, you can't know what to listen to if you've never been educated to understand the value of facts or fact that is worthy of your attention. So if there's just all this information that's flowing and it, it just becomes this, these waves of, of, of maybe uncoordinated thought, you see, when, when I was growing up, when you're talking about being young, the one thing somebody told me one time that really helped me, he says, you know how to listen. I was going like, wow, I thought everybody did that. <laughs> but see, that starts in the home. And I don't want to start talking about home training. But for the point, standpoint that, see, we went through, see, this whole thing with media, you have to, for, 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 your, for your history uh, lesson on this, is that the whole thing of youth culture, as it began after World War II, after you ended up, you started with James Dean, okay? And then you go from this rebel with some kind of cause, right? Uh, the whole thing just sort of moves on, and after a while, all these voices, I mean, that's why, and, and you wrote in, in, your, in your pamphlet, I noticed, you mentioned Marlon Brando. See, Marlon Brando is a really interesting character, and for me, Marlon Brando is an interesting character, because that's where I got Dog Girl from. When they have in in the L.A. Times, they have this this magazine this uh, this this area where they do entertainment called the calendar, and in the calendar, when they came out with the first Superman, they asked Marlon Brando, "How did you like being in the film playing Superman's father?" And he goes, "Well, I like those those doggerel moments." And I said, "What is this word doggerel? What is he talking about?" And it turns out, within the definition that I just gave earlier, in regular variation on a theme, and um, I realized there's, between the time, be as actors are sp speaking to one another, there's that space. And in that space, the probability of anything that can happen, that space is called doggerel, OK? And I said, wow, to a certain degree, that's how I feel as an African-American in this society. I'm in a doggerel space. OK? So to a certain degree, how could you determine that you were in a space of that nature? First and foremost, if you're not willing to listen. I mean, you find yourself probably in circumstances with another person in conversation, and you realize that, oh, there's something that's not communicating here. And you're just there in that space to try to figure out what is that person speaking about, OK? So in that sense, that's how I arrived at that particular ideology that I'm speaking of. As a matter of fact, I, I call it now my dogrealism. Did I answer your question? <laughs> you know, no, I mean, I mean, really. The, see, the thing is, first of all, first and foremost, with all this, like you said, the, the multiple notions of, of of communication that exist, people aren't listening to each other. I think, to a certain degree, they don't know what to listen to or why they should listen to certain bits of information that are come their way. And unfortunately, people are only listening to the information that they think satisfies the way they think. You, you're going to run into contradiction. And that's where your education is supposed to help you decipher the difference. Most people don't know the difference, unfortunately, between a Ford and a Chevy.
So I think on that note, we'll, <laughs> we'll wrap up. Thank you, Ulysses, um, for giving us your time and for right. speaking with us. Thank and you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming out tonight.